Welcome to the Talking Poem Podcast. I'm your host, Charlie Green. This is a rare back-to-back solo episode. I've had a couple people have to postpone due to illness, so I'm wishing them well and also recording this so listeners will have something a little to listen to. And I also want to build off of last week's discussion about sound. I want to do it with a poem that is really well known among poets. It's in a lot of anthologies. It's taught quite a lot. It's Robert Hayden's poem, Those Winter Sundays. And it's a poem that I have known for decades now. I think I probably read it in my first introduction to creative writing class way back when I was a wee undergraduate. But if you're unfamiliar with it or you'd just like to hear it again, I will read it aloud here in just a moment. I do want to mention that after I talk about the poem, I will have a little bit of behind the scenes stuff to share with you about the show in case you're curious. But as with all solo episodes, this will be shorter, more bite-sized than usual. So, those winter Sundays. Sundays, too, my father got up early and put his clothes on in the blue-black cold. Then, with cracked hands that ached from labor in the weekday weather, made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. I'd wake and hear the cold splintering, breaking. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house, speaking indifferently to him who had driven out the cold and polished my good shoes as well. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? I really love this poem. It's a poem that no matter how many times I've taught it, I love it every time I come back to it, which is always, I think, an impressive feat for a poem to keep holding on to that richness. Even though it's a poem that in some ways seems pretty straightforward, it's a a lament by a child, by a son, about the things his father did for him that he didn't appreciate and that got overlooked by the frustrations that they had with each other and the sternness and the kind of masculine silence that they had when he was a child. And this is a nearly religious kind of duty that his father did for him. It was Sundays, there's the offices, which shout out to David Joss, who introduced me to this poem forever ago, that the offices are a kind of religious office as well as that Sundays. And so, but I want to talk about sound with this poem because for years when I was reading it and teaching it for the first times, when we would talk about sound, we would talk about the sounds that are drawing a lot of attention to themselves in the first stanza, put his clothes on in the blue black cold, then with cracked hands that ached from labor and the weekday weather made banked fires blaze. No one ever thanked him. There's all that internal rhyme. There's the A of labor and made and blaze. There are those hard C and K sounds. And with students, I'd always talk about, you know, the way that those sounds maybe mimic both the tension in the house and the sound of as the house is warming up and the ice is cracking, you can feel and hear things shifting. But there's another element of sound that I think probably gets discussed less. I haven't seen it discussed much in the many textbooks in which this appears and has some commentary. And it really took me a long time to hear it because I think that younger poets, younger writers sometimes get more attuned to more obvious kinds of sound effects. And what ends up happening is subtler sounds go less noticed And it was certainly the case for me that I was paying a lot of attention to the sounds in that first stanza. And over time, the more time I've spent with this poem, the more I hear the subtlety that comes with the sounds that draw less attention or less obvious attention. When the rooms were warm, he'd call, and slowly I would rise and dress, fearing the chronic angers of that house. Once the rooms are warm, we hear those softer sounds, the when, warm, the M of rooms and warm, the S's of slowly, I would rise and dress. And those sounds aren't arbitrarily chosen. They work by contrast with those louder sounds. And yet, because they are quieter sounds, I think at least I was overlooking them for a long time or not giving them their due. And you even hear that phrase, fearing the chronic angers of that house. We get the brief moment of the kind of sparking back up with those chronic angers. And then in those last two lines, just 
always get to me. What did I know? What did I know of love's austere and lonely offices? And one of the things I love about it is the O sound in the repetition of no and no and lonely. And I feel like the echo of that sound gives a harder hit to lonely. And so just a lot of great things happening with sound. The fact that pretty much all the rhyme is internal and that the language is pretty straightforward and mostly plain spoken, especially as the poem moves into the second and third stanzas. And yet there's such a richness to the kind of emotion he's evoking and a real richness to the sound. So just a big fan of the poem. Just a reminder that if you leave a five-star rating with a review, I will write a limerick or a haiku for a future episode in tribute to you. I do want to give people a bit of a behind-the-scenes explanation of what I'm doing here and how the podcast works. And today I just want to focus on the name of the podcast, The Talking Poem Podcast. And I just want to list a few alternative titles. And what's interesting to me about these is that they all came to me after I started <laughs> uploading the podcast. And they're the sort of things that would be, I think, perfect ideas for titles, but some people may disagree. I just wanted to share this list. Podzamandius. I don't know if that works for you. Pod Real Cool or We Pod Cool. And then I went on a bit of a frost run. Nothing pod can stay. The pod not taken. Podding by woods on a snowy evening. Then got off of frost and did a lateral move over to Langston Hughes. I too pod America. For the Joy Harjo fans out there, she pods some horses. Obviously, the only reason that doesn't work is that I'm male, and so she wouldn't work. And then the two that really I should probably change the name of the show to one of these, The Podacy, I think, or Pod's Grandeur. So just wanted to give you a little bit of a snippet into how the show works and into my poisoned brain. I hope you have a great day. Go pet some dogs, read some poems, and support some striking workers wherever you find them. And I will talk to you next week. Bye. Because I could not pod for death, the love song of J. Alfred Podrock, Theodore Rethke's My Pod Puzz Waltz, Self Podcast in a Convex Mirror, Pod on a Grecian Urn, The Rhyme of the Ancient Podcaster, Lyrical Podcasters, Not Waving But Podcasting, Podcast Recorded in a Country Churchyard.